Welcome to today's video. Today we're going to learn about very important notions such as parallel transport and the notion of geodesics and we will also learn about curvature. Now before we get into parallel transport in a rigorous definition, let's first think a little bit about the intuitive idea of parallel transport. You have done drawing parallels, right, uh, in school, that you like set a ruler like that and then slide another ruler on it like this, and then draw parallel lines, right? This is kind of the notion of parallel transport. You have a vector field that is a, a vector for every point, right? And then this vector field, as I move, there is a curve, if you want gamma, this straight line, as I move along gamma, I'm just taking the vectors not to vary, not to change its direction as I move along the curve. So I say that I'm transporting this vector parallelly along the curve, if the vector doesn't change as I move. Well, that's very nice and dandy for a flat manifold like this one or two, but then um, you also know that things become a little bit more complicated when you have things like curvature. Even though we haven't yet defined what curvature means in a differentiable manifold, as in like, what does it mean to be curved for a manifold of kittens, right? We do know that there is an intuitive notion of curvature that you can think that, for example, on Earth, as I walk on Earth, I can think of the vector field defined by the direction of my nose as I move in a trajectory. And if you don't have a nose, you can just put a marker like I do. And then you can walk, right, without moving your head. And then as you walk on Earth, that vector is not changing. It's being transported parallelly. I'm not moving it, I'm just keeping it. But because I'm walking, my curve is, the curve I'm moving is in a manifold with curvature or in a sphere, in a surface with curvature here, then uh, it's gonna look, if I look from the outside, if I look from the point of view of, in mind that I embed this sphere in R3, if I look from the perspective of an external observer, I would see my nose changing direction right as I walk on Earth because Earth is curved. All right, so, but still being transported parallelly, I'm being really careful not to change the direction as I move. All right, now connecting with the notion of covariant derivative that we saw in the previous video, we know that vector fields, when I move along a manifold, or along a curve in a manifold, can change because of two different factors, right? Two different contributions. They can change because the components of the vector change, but they can also change because kind of the elements of the basis are twisted. Could it be, it could be because there's curvature, or it could be because of the particular curvilinear coordinates that I chose. But you see, the variation of a vector field on a curve is precisely, to compute it, is precisely why we introduce the notion of covariant derivative. So, maybe this notion of parallel transport of move a vector field along a curve and make sure that it doesn't change along the curve, in the case of a differentiable manifold, you need to make sure that it doesn't change for real. The full change of it. So you need to demand not only that the components don't change, you need to demand that the covariant derivative of it doesn't change. That is the thing, remember, that accounts for all the variation of the vector field as I move along the curve. I hope that this kind of clarifies the context in which this uh, is going to make sense. Now let's introduce it a little bit more rigorously. Given a parametrization of a curve, now let's talk about parametrizations a little bit before doing this. Since we're going to be talking about parametrization of curves, I thought it would be a good idea to refresh our memories on what parametrizations are. Let's go to a very simple example of a circumference in R2. It's a very simple curve, that's gamma. And one curve gamma can admit many different parametrizations. For example, I have here, so again, the parametrization, this is R2, right? So it's immediate to assign coordinates to R2. X mu of S is X1 of S. The X is what we call right X1, right? And Y, let's call it X2. So X could be sine of S, cos is cosine of S. S, the parameter, acts like as the number of steps that I take, right? Or you can think of it as time. <laughs> what is the point as a function of time? So I have this one at time zero, this is the point zero, one. So zero in the x-axis, one in the y-axis. I start here. And as I increase s, I start here. And as I increase s, I start moving in this direction. <laughs> pi over two, I get here. <laughs> pi, three pi over two, two pi. And I describe the whole circle, right? The whole, circum the whole circumference. All right, but a different parametrization. Now there's a different parameter. Let me call it s prime. S prime is a different parameter. This thing, but this also parametrizes the same curve. Right? How come? Well, look, at uh, s prime equals 0, I'm in the point 1 for x and 0 for y, so I'm here. And as I increase s, I start moving in this direction. Two, 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 pi over 2, pi, 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 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. 
So I describe the same circumference, right? Now, I can be even wilder and then parameterize the curve like this with the cosine of s squared sine s squared, which looks a, little, a lot like this parameterization, but only with a square. Well, it will still describe the same circle. It still describes the same circumference, right? Uh, only that I'm walking faster <laughs> as I move. And same here, right? Uh, this is even faster with an exponential, but it also parameterizes the same curve. And also, if I write like a 10 here and a 10 here, you know, that would be a different parameter if you want. You can reabsorb that and call it S tilde, and you would get a curve that still is the same curve, the same circum circumference, but parameterized with respect to different parameters. So I hope that this uh, refreshes a little bit our mind on parameterizations of curves, right? Now, let's go back to the definition of parallel transport. Given a parameterization of the curve gamma s, whose tangent vector we call ws, so remember, ws is this tangent vector here. If I'm moving in this direction, in a parameterization that moves in this direction, then this is the tangent vector, right? It tells you what direction to take the steps. Of what you remember from calculus, this w vector, right, in coordinates, in a coordinate basis, would be x dot mu uh, of with respect to s, right? So this thing is dx mu ds. That is the tangent vector to the curve, to the, to the curve parameterized by the parameter s. So given this curve with this tangent vector, we define the covariant derivative of a tensor tau along the curve. So basically, how does the tensor vary as I move along the curve? as the directional covariant derivative of t along the direction of the tangent vector. So it makes sense to see how a tensor varies as I move along the curve. Just check how it varies as in the direction that I'm moving. I'm moving in this direction here, 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 here. So if I check the directional derivative of the tensor field in the direction that I'm moving of the tangent vector of the curve, then I will get the variation of the tensor field along the curve. And of course, this is this. This is the covariant derivative that we studied in a previous video in the direction of W of the tensor field T. Now, establishing that, now I have a notion of uh, covariant derivative of a tensor along a curve, which is again the same as covariant derivative of a tensor field along the direction tangent to a curve. We will say that T is parallel transported along the curve, gamma S, if and only if the directional derivative of the tensor field with respect to the tangent vector in the direction of the tangent vector to the curve is zero. So literally what we were saying at the beginning of the video, a vector or a tensor, let's think of a vector, but it's a tensor field, right? Any tensor field is parallel transported along a curve is the total variation, the covariant derivative of the tensor in the direction of motion of the curve when I move along the curve is zero. The curve, the tensor field doesn't change, all right? So this is the same that you were doing when you were drawing parallel lines, the same thing that you were doing when you were walking without moving your nose on Earth. We are moving along curves, making sure that the total variation of the tensor field that takes everything into account, right, the total variation in the direction of the curve is zero. And indeed, you would get zero here if, when, in the case of a plane, when you slide a ruler or another ruler to draw the vectors that correspond to that vector field that are all parallel, and you will also get zero uh, covariant derivative along the direction of a curve if you consider the curve to be the trajectory of somebody and the vector field, uh, the nose of that person, if that person doesn't move their head as they walk along Earth. All right? So we have a notion of parallel transport that uses the notion of covariant derivative that we saw in the previous video. Tensor doesn't change along the curve, then tensor is parallel transported. <laughs> All right, now that we've introduced the notion of parallel transport, the next notion that we're going to introduce is the notion of geodesic curve. Now, a geodesic curve is different from the notion of geodesic. The notion of geodesic curve is about a curve. The notion of geodesic is about a curve and a particular parameterization. So let's go step by step. A curve gamma is a geodesic curve if and only if it admits a parameterization, a gamma of s, whose tangent vector, ws, which is partial s, remember that the tangent vector is precisely what takes the directional derivative along a curve of a function, right? And therefore you can call it partial s, is such that, look at this, the directional derivative of the tangent vector in the direction of the curve, which is the directional derivative of the tangent vector in the direction of the tangent vector, is proportional to the tangent vector. So this is very interesting. In an arbitrary basis, we can write it like this. Remember, this is the covariant derivative this is the components of the covariant derivative of the tangent vector. This is contracting with the tangent vector gives me 
the directional covariant derivative in the direction of the tangent vector, of the tangent vector, and we say it's proportional to the tangent vector itself. Now, this is very interesting because remember that the tangent vector is kind of giving you the velocity uh, at which I go along the curve, right? The velocity the direction and the velocity how fast I go along the curve. What this is telling me is that as I move along the curve, so the variation of the velocity as I move along the curve, it's just a change of acceleration in a way. It's just going faster or slower, but it cannot be a change of direction. It's not going around in different directions because all the variation of the tangent vector as I move along the curve is in the direction of the tangent vector itself. It's parallel to itself. So the tangent vector can become, I don't know, proportional with a larger proportionality constant. I say like, I'm going a bit faster, a bit slower, whatever, but I'm not changing direction. I'm keeping it in the same direction. All right? All right. After defining the notion of geodesic curve, then let's define the notion of geodesic. Now, if you can do, if you, if the geodesic curve admits parameterization for which the directional derivative of the tangent vector is proportional to itself, then we can find always a parameterization gamma of tau. This is a particular parameterization such that the tangent vector, let's call it V of t in this particular parameterization, which is partial t, it's parallel transported along gamma. So basically it's telling me that the proportionality constant here is zero. I can find a parameter for which the directional derivative of the velocity, if you want, of the tangent vector in the direction of the tangent vector is zero. We call this tau the affine parameter. This is important, the affine parameter of the curve, of the geodesic curve, right? And it's unique. Well, it's unique modulo multiplication and addition of constants. That is nice. <laughs> Why? Well, this is the freedom of the physicist. <laughs> because you can always uh, change units and change your origin of times, right? <laughs> anyway, we will discuss more of that when we talk about relativity. But this is math telling me that if this is parameterizing a curve as I move in time, you can decide to count your time in whatever units you want and give an origin of time, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cool. Anyway, so anyway, that's the affine parameter is unique modulo multiplication and addition of con constants. All right. So this particular parameterization of gamma, gamma being a geodesic curve. So a geodesic curve, once parameterized in terms of its affine parameter, is what we call a geodesic. All right. Very important. This is a geodesic. Cool. Now. A geodesic is a particularly important notion. I mean, maybe you have heard this notion of, oh, geodesic is the smallest distance between two points and so on and so forth. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> it's, it's very, very related with Hamilton's principle. And rather than smallest, it's kind of like stationary. It could be the largest or it could be the smallest. <laughs> okay, we will discuss that when we see uh, variational principles and geodesics and what is the relationship between them. But... Uh, the notion of geodesic that you have heard about, like, oh, yeah, it's the kind of the shortest distance between two points and things like that. Well, you can tell already that it's going to be an important notion. It's definitely going to be a very important notion in relativity, okay? So maybe we want to characterize what are the equations that a geodesic curve, so a curve and an affine parameterization, have to satisfy in order to be a geodesic. Well, the condition is easy. The condition is this one, right? We have it there, when v is the tangent vector. In a coordinate basis, it becomes particularly simple. Remember that the curve gets parameterized as some x mu of tau, when written in Rn, like I did that, and uh, that the tangent vector gets parameterized to x dot mu, right? The tangent vector is the velocity. So if we write it in coordinates, then we get, let me first write it with v. So that would be v mu, nabla mu, nabla mu, v nu equals zero. Right, but let's write it in terms of uh, the coordinate basis uh, now that I have the parameterization in terms of the velocity. Well, then uh, the condition is x dot mu nabla mu x dot nu equals zero. So this is the geodesic equation. This is the equation that geodesics have to satisfy. Uh, we can expand it a little bit because we can work. This is a vector field, right? So this is the covariant derivative of a vector field. I can expand it in terms of the coefficients of the connection, and I can do that, like that. But this equation, I can simplify. 
And now, let me erase this to do a little bit of math. All right? And uh, because this week can be simplified. Let's think what this term, the first term is. So let me write this equation. Let's, let me write the whole thing. X dot mu, and I have partial mu. X dot mu plus uh, gamma mu, sigma mu, X dot sigma, and this multiplied also X on mu. All right. This term here is something that is easy to analyze. Let me write what it is. Let me write this one first. <laughs> this one is partial X dot mu partial x mu, right? And then I write this one after, just because. <laughs> this one is a uh, uh, derivative of x mu with respect to tau. All right. Oh my, but what is this? <laughs> this is chain rule right there. What I have here is, literally this is the derivative, let me just write it here, this thing is the derivative with respect to tau of x dot nu. Right? You can tell. This is literally chain rule. It's take another derivative with respect to tau. But this thing, of course, is the second derivative with respect to tau of n squared of x nu. All right? So this vector right here is the second derivative with respect to the affine parameter of x mu, the parameterized trajectory, right? The position, if you want. Well, that means that I can rewrite this equation, the geodesic equation that I have here if I equate this to zero as follows. This is going to be equal to x dot dot uh, nu, right, plus gamma nu sigma mu x dot sigma x dot mu equal zero. And this is the equation that the geodesics have to satisfy, which is the same equation as this one. Okay, this equation, this equation, same thing. All right. What does that it remind you of? <laughs> it has to remind you of something. Think about it. The geodesic equation, it looks a lot like something like Newton's second law when there's no forces. <laughs> what is Newton's second law when there's no forces? It tells you, okay, mass times acceleration equals forces, right? The total force in here, but if it's zero, yeah, this is the motion of an inertial particle, <laughs> you see? Like, this is the, the mass cancels, and this is the equation of motion in Newtonian physics for an inertial particle, right? <laughs> so you can tell that the geodesics, in a way, are generalizing the notion of an inertial particle. We're not gonna talk, I mean, this is not physics, this is math, but I think it's extremely suggestive that physics is like peeking in saying, hey, dude, uh, talk to me. You know, because the, 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 it's literally something like a generalization of Newton's second law in absence of forces. So maybe this gives you a definition, a generalization of the notion of inertiality. Just no longer have inertia, have geodesic. Look at that. When the coefficients of the connection are zero, so remember the case of flat manifolds with uh, using Cartesian coordinates, right? You're going to get nothing here. <laughs> and then you get something like Newton's... Uh, Newton's law for inertial frames, right? <laughs> so yeah, this thing is a generalization. You see the notion of geodesic, how it generalizes the notion of like inertial trajectory in a way, even though we're doing math, we see it peak. <laughs> All right, this is pretty cool. So this is the geodesic equation, and uh, this is gonna be an important this. I mean, I'll write it also, let me just write it here. So the geodesic equation, these two equations that are the same one, is the, one of the most, in, in a coordinate, in, you can tell that it's in a coordinate basis, right? Uh, these equations are going to be important, and we're going to be using them everywhere, okay? It's very important in general relativity, and very important for physicists in general, as you can tell. And even more so will be the case when we actually see them as a variational principle. <laughs> so yeah, physics and the notion of geodesics, strangely, intrinsically related, okay? So it's important to learn them well and not to get lost in it. So make sure that these concepts are solidified. All right, let's talk about the notion of curvature. Imagine that I asked you, how do you know if you live in a curved manifold? Uh, for example, how do you know you're in, on a sphere, for example? Imagine that that sphere is not inside an R3. You're like tiny ants. You cannot get out of Earth to see it. So everything looks locally flat. How could be, uh, if you're intelligent, you should be able to come up with ways in which you can see curvature. And what are those ways? Okay, there are several. Way number one. Uh, yeah, when I parallel transport a vector along a closed trajectory, if I'm in a flat, so for example, my nose, 
if I'm in a, imagine this uh, this room being the flat uh, the flat floor of this room, right? I have my nose, and then I move, and I close the trajectory, and I go back to the way it was. Well, the vector. If I start first, I draw the vector at the start, and then I walk, and then I come back to the same vector. It's going to be pointed in the same direction. That is certainly because the floor is flat. If it weren't, that wouldn't be the case. For example, let's pick the following trajectory here. So we have a sphere. And let's go down. I start on the North Pole. And I go down uh, on something like a, like a meridian, like this, right? And then, of course, the, the nose is pointing in this direction as it's part of the transported along the meridian. When it gets to the equator, it's pointing in this direction. Then I continue following this, okay? And when I continue following this line, I parallel transport the nose, I don't move my head, right? And let's say I do 90 degrees, like that, and then I go back, or where I was. And as I go back, I go along this, li along this line, along this line, along this line, along this line, oh my God, along this line, Oh my God, when I came back to the North Pole <laughs> without moving my head, when I, when I come back to the North Pole, then suddenly I'm no longer pointing in the same direction. My nose is not pointing in the same direction. So I can detect, oh, this has to be because there's curvature. If it were a flat surface, that's impossible. <laughs> right, so that's one way to detect, uh, to detect curvature. Parallel transporting a vector along a curve that is closed and seeing that when I come back, the vector is not proportional to the original vector anymore. Okay, that's one way. Another way, well, you can draw a triangle like this, and if you do this triangle, you know that this is 90 degrees, 90 degrees, right, as you did it, uh, but then this one is a non-zero angle. It could be another 90 degrees, for example. So the sum of the angles of, the, of a triangle is no longer 180 degrees. <laughs> that's also another sign that you are not in a flat surface. All right, it's yet another one. That's one of the Euclidean, that's the one we're gonna focus on most. We're gonna see this one a little bit, the parallel transport one, but the one we're gonna focus on more because it's more useful for us uh, is the notion of violating one of the Euclid axioms, right? Uh, remember that one of the Euclid axioms is that, oh, parallel lines never touch, or if you want to be more poetic, they touch at infinity, right? Anyway, parallel curves don't touch, and it's true. Parallel curves, you have two vectors that are parallel, vectors that are, if you want, proportional, but just translated, then, of course, they generate curves that don't touch. Two meridians are parallel. <laughs> so, in the, on, the, on the sphere, two parallel curves like this one and this one, the, the two meridians generated by these vector fields, right? As I move, so the, the geodesics <laughs> that these vector fields generate, are going to be parallel, but still touch. They are parallel all the time. You see the vector fields, I mean, I'm such a bad drawer, but you can see with these two, for example. And, uh, and yet, when I, uh, when I prolong them, they actually touch in a finite point. They have an intersection and a finite distance. So if you have something like that. If two geodesics, which start parallel, get closer, that is a sign that you have curvature. Two geodesics getting closer or further away, that is a sign that you have curvature. Now, of course, we don't have a metric here, so therefore we don't have a notion of distance. So what do you mean getting close or getting further away? Well, we'll see it because we can build the notion of curvature. Let me do it. First of all, let me define something called the Riemann tensor. First realization, let's consider a function, what we call a scalar, and a one form. So, and then uh, for, let's consider a symmetric connection. Do you remember what a symmetric connection was? A symmetric connection is a connection for which the covariant derivative nabla a nabla b acting on the function is equal to the covariant derivative nabla b nabla a acting on the function. That happens with a symmetric connection, and we discussed that in length uh, in a previous video. Okay, so for a symmetric connection, this is true. When I act with the double anti-symmetrized covariant derivative on the product of the function and the one form, I can take the function out, right? Because I can apply this other derivative, I can apply Leibniz rule, and then you see that the derivative of f is zero. When you apply the derivative of the first and the derivative of the second are the same, and when you take the difference between the two, uh, it's zero. So I can treat this as something that can come out of the derivative. 
This is nice. But what does that mean though? Well, that means that uh, this operation that I'm doing on a product of a function of a one form, I can factor out the function. That's exactly what happens with a tensor. Tensors are linear maps, remember? A tensor, when you have a, well, as we did in previous videos, if you have a tensor acting, so if I have a tensor that acts, for example, on a one form, I don't know, let me call it omega. Uh, if I multiply by some function f, then this is f tensor acting on omega, right? If it's a scalar, this f is a function or scalar. So this is the definition of a tensor. So that means that this thing here has to be a tensor. All right, what kind of tensor? Well, we know exactly what kind of tensor is because of the covariance structure of the expression. It's going to be a one-free tensor. Let me write it like that. So you see, I have a tensor. You see that I know the type of tensor because I know how many indices it has to have, right? It has to eat a one form because a tensor for one forms, and then it has to have three uh, covariant indices because this thing has co three covariant indices. So certainly it has to be a one free tensor. And this one free tensor, I just call it R. Okay, and I, de I define it as the tensor like this is defined by saying the contraction of this tensor with an arbitrary one form omega d is given by this expression. All right, now something so far is just a definition, right? I just realized that if the if the connection is symmetric, this thing is a tensor, and it's the Riemann. Ten I'm gonna call it the Riemann tensor, and I can define it like that. All right, now if I know, so this is totally defined because if I know the action on forms, I know the action on vectors. In fact, from this expression, I can prove the following other expression. Like that. From assuming this true, because it's a definition, then I can prove this. So the action on one forms defines the action on vectors. The tensor is fully defined. Now, question for you. How easy do you think is to prove that? Starting from here, getting this. It has to be very easy because uh, uh, that was a midterm question, maybe the first time I taught this course. Okay? So as you see, this is an example of a midterm question. <laughs> Proof. Assuming this true, prove this. Uh, in this case, we're going to solve it. So you see what I mean by a simple question. It's just index notation, playing with Linus rule and index notation. Let's do it. Like many times that we've done exercises like this, like uh, knowing how things are defined for vectors, finding for one forms and things like that, what we're going to do is apply this object to the contraction between a vector and a one form. And why so? Because I know it's zero. Because the contraction between a vector and a one form is a scalar. And we know that uh, with a symmetric connection, uh, the action of uh, the covariant derivative, the uh, second covariant derivative AB on the function is equal to the action of the second derivative BA on the function, right? So I know that it's exactly zero, all right? And from here, we're going to be able to find a way to prove that this implies this. So the first step is apply Lagny's rule, all right? Let's do it. All right, so all that I did is on the first derivative acting from the right, I mean, first this one, so this is a B first, the A, I do nothing, I keep it there, and the B, I act on it, and I use like this rule, derivative of the first times second, plus the, uh, there's the first times derivative of the second. And then I do the same here with a minus sign, but now is the derivative subindex A, the one that acts first. All right, so next step, let's apply it again. Let's do, let's apply the derivative with respect to A now. All right, so all that I did is expand the second derivative here, and again, this, this one is like rule first. Derivative of the first term times the second without multiplying, this, and then the first one with a derivation times the derivative of the second. So the first one with a derivation times the derivative of the second, right? And then same thing with this term. So derivative of the first and uh, times uh, the second with a derivation, and then uh, the first times the derivative of the second, and so on and so forth. And I do the same with this one, but with the minus sign. Nabla A, B, C, Nabla B, Omega C. Aha, this term, I mean, if you want, I'm gonna just write it here. This term cancels with this one. All right, so we have a cancellation right there. You can tell that this is the same as that, all right? And then this other term, let's do it with a different color. This term cancels with this one. You can tell that they're the same. So I know that this is equal to zero, of course. And let me just add these simplifications, see what we get. All right, so I just grouped uh, the terms that where the derivative acts on BC, I grouped them here. So there's this one, right? Minus uh, this one here, the derivatives add on BC, and both of them have omega C uh, contracted. 
And I use the same with the terms that, uh, grouping the terms uh, where you have uh, the double derivative antisymmetrized acting on omega c. Now, what I do now is realize that we have the Riemann tensor here, right? In fact, look at the definition. This thing right here is exactly the Riemann tensor R A B C D omega D, right? So what I do, I'm going to put this on the other side, and I get the following. On this side, I get nabla A, nabla B, minus nabla B, nabla A, acting on VC, contracted with omega C. And this is equal now to uh, minus R A B C D omega D, contracted with VC. All right, so identifying tensors. <laughs> I have, maybe I'll use a different color. This thing here has to be equal to this one, right? How, how do I know that? Somebody would say, no, 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 look, this is a D, and this is a C, and this should be a D. Well, again, dummy indices, right? So let's, this is a dummy index. If I want, I can call this dummy index D without prejudice. <laughs> you see? Uh, it's a dummy index, it's summing, so I can call it D. This is the thing that trips over most people that are starting with index notation, so that's why I emphasize it. All right, wonderful. So this thing, is the, the blue things have to be equal because omega D is the same on both sides, right? Wonderful. So then we have that minus R, A, B, C, D, V, C, so the contraction with the third co covariant index of the Riemann tensor uh, with V, C, with a minus sign is exactly equal to this, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. And then you can happily declare the equality proved. And we proved it. Now, even you can even box it <laughs> because you're very sure it's true. All right. The only trippy part, I guess, for some people is this step that definitely trips people. I know that people count office hours. Again, remember, and I, I won't get tired of saying it. If I have A, B, uh, B, B, if I want, I can call this it's a sum over B. Well, it could be equally a sum over, I don't know, J for Joshua, and I change the index, and it's exactly the same thing. And if this thing is equal to sum over J, uh, I don't know, something else, E, J, F, J, right? I still can't change this one to, I don't know, uh, epsilon if I want, sum over epsilon, sum over epsilon, right? Because it's the same freaking thing. It's a sum, it's a sum index, a dummy index. The sums are equal. All right. Wonderful. So we proved now that uh, we define, because of the fact that the connection is symmetric, we can define a tensor that I call the Riemann tensor that is defined this way. And it's a full tensor that I know how to define. It's action on one forms and it's action on vectors like this, like it did. Now, because of the properties of the connection, the Riemann tensor has some symmetries that we're going to talk about now. The Riemann tensor, because it's related to the connection, right, is defined through the anti-symmetrized application of the covariant derivative, inherits some symmetries or acquires some symmetries through the symmetries of uh, the covariant derivative, the connection, the coefficients of the connection. In particular, it's anti-symmetric in the first two indices, like this. Uh, it's anti-symmetric power with respect to the, to the three covariant indices is zero and also satisfies something called Yankee's identity, which is this triple anti-symmetrization, three in this anti-symmetrization is equal to zero of the covariant derivative of the Riemann. All right, uh, we may want to find the components of the Riemann tensor in a coordinate basis, if we want to find them. The components in a coordinate basis can be easily found. I did the calculation here, let me walk you through it. To find the components of the Riemann in a coordinate basis, you have several ways to do it. The one that I chose here is to write the expression that we uh, proved, uh, that is that the minus the Riemann contracting in this way with a vector field is precisely the action of the anti-symmetrized covariant derivative on the vector field. Now, with this expression, we can just expand it like this, right? And then let's start doing the covariant derivatives in this order. I'm gonna be doing first this covariant derivative and this covariant derivative. Right? So if I do it, this is the covariant derivative of a tensor that is one time covariant, one time contravariant. We get the partial derivative of the components minus, uh, minus because it's for the covariant index now, the contraction of the coefficient of the metric with the lower index with the covariant index, and with a plus the contraction of the first covariant index 
of the coefficient of the connection with uh, the contravariant index. And I write here minus, well, the second part is the same, right, with a minus, but swapping mu and nu. I just, instead of writing it explicitly, we have it here, and this represents the same expression, but swapping mu and nu. All right. Okay, so the next step is expanding all the covariant derivatives that we have here, right? Let's expand them using the same expressions that we know for the covariant derivative of uh, a vector field. And then we have them here, all right, respecting the signs that every term has. This is just grinding through the arithmetics. And of course, we also have minus the same expression swapping the indices. Now, let's see what this simplifies to. Now, this one, now because this is a coordinate basis, of course, uh, partial mu commute with partial nu. So when we swap to do the minus term, the term that comes from the other part of the commutator is gonna cancel this term. So this is not there. Okay, cool. What else? Now let's focus on uh, this term over here. So this term over here, you see that when you swap nu and mu, uh, it acquires a minus sign on this on this term, right? And it's not equal to this one, but then it cancels this one. <laughs> the one that you get when you swap mu and mu with the minus signs will cancel this one. So this will be canceled. But then again, this one, when, when you swap mu and mu and you get a negative one, will actually, uh, it appears here, will cancel this one. So neither of these terms are there. All right. All right, so let's compile all the terms that are left. So the first one, we, let's take a v rho common factor first. And what multiplies v rho? Well, the first term is this one. Now, of course, this one generates these two. This one from the positive part and this one uh, from the negative part. So let me just write it here. These two are generated by this one. This one is with mu and nu and then swapping. There's literals here. And when you swap nu and mu, you get the contribution with the minus sign coming from here. So this, these two terms are accounted for with this one. And of course, multiplying v rho. Now, how about, uh, how about this one? Where does this one come from? Well, this one that I wrote here comes from this one. So what I did, so how do I do that? Like a square maybe? <laughs> uh, this one gives me this one. And also it's gonna give me this one. What did I do here? Well, I know that there is a lambda, but again, it's a dummy index. I can, and this is rho here, but it's a dummy index. So I can call this index rho lambda, and I can call this index lambda rho. I can do a swap of the indices because they're dummy indices, I can call them Joshua. And doing so, I get exactly this expression, right? If I call the rho lambda, and the lambda rho. And of course, I get the one with the negative sign swapping mu and nu coming from this term. Wonderful. So what are we left with? The thing that we're left with is this term here. But this term here, you can see that there's a factor uh, lambda mu nu that you can take as common factor. And uh, this multiplies the partial derivative of the vector and then contracted with the coefficient of the connection. This is precisely the covariant derivative of the vector. So you get, and of course you get the anti-symmetrized uh, version because of course you swap mu mu with a minus sign here. So you get the anti-symmetrized minus twice the anti symmetry Remember the anti symmetrization has a one half, that's why you need a two. Anti-symmetrization of the uh, coefficient of the connection. However, remember, this is a coordinate basis. All right, first thing. And second, uh, the, we are, our connection has no torsion. It's torsion free. It's a symmetric connection. Because of that, remember from the previous video that lambda mu nu is equal to zero in a coordinate basis because the connection is torsion free. So because of that, this goes to zero. So now we can extract the components here. You can tell that v rho v rho, so the components are exactly this with a minus sign. And because again, same thing, right? The coefficients mu nu equals lambda or gamma lambda nu nu because again, coordinate basis and uh, symmetric connection, torsion-free connection, then let me just write this as follows. So the component R nu nu rho sigma of the Riemann tensor is, well, I need to swap the sign, and I'm also gonna put the sigma, the nu first, because that's more common, usually found. So I'm gonna write this, first the positive one, partial nu, gamma, sigma, mu rho, because I can do it, minus partial mu, gamma, sigma, nu, rho, all right? And then plus gamma, sigma, lambda, nu, gamma, lambda, rho, mu, minus gamma, sigma, lambda, mu, 
gamma, lambda, rho, nu. All right. And this is, these are the components of the Riemann tensor in a coordinate basis. By the way, not to confuse people with the notes online, the expression that I have in the notes online is this one, it's exactly this one, only that it's written slightly different. First of all, these are swapped, but it's okay because we're in a coordinate basis, so... And I just write this one first and this one second, which is the same because they're numbers. So let's do it here just to have the expression exactly the same way as I have in the notes. And now it looks exactly as I have it in the notes, all right? Now, a curious thing, a little curious point. Remember that to have this, we have to assume two things, right? We have to assume that we're in a coordinate basis and that the connection is torsion-free. Now, if we assume that we are in a coordinate basis, but we don't assume that we are uh, we use in a connection that is torsion free, then well the derivation carries. You can follow the derivation and you would get something like that as well. And this thing and this thing would not cancel. Well, actually, this thing is still called even in that case when you have a covariant derivative, a, a, co a connection, an affine connection that has torsion. Even in that case, you still call this thing or what, would be, what would be this thing the Riemann tensor, and this thing would be connected to the torsion tensor. All right. So, just so you know, even though we're not going to see torsion at all in this course, because we're not going to use it, it's not used in regular AGR, uh, just so you know, you have that the, this thing will still be the Riemann tensor, even if we had some torsion and this thing didn't cancel. All right, so now that we've seen the Riemann tensor, let's see now the Ricci tensor. The Ricci tensor is defined as the trace of the Riemann tensor, that is the contraction of the second covariant index with the contravariant index. Now, this tensor is particularly useful, as we will see when we study relativity, and we will see why. Now, notice that here, I have not picked a particular connection and a particular covariant derivative. Now, we don't have a metric yet. In most, if you, you have to be careful when you search online for properties of the Riemann tensor, for properties of the Ricci and curvature in general, because most texts online assume that you work in a Riemannian manifold. So that assumes many of the things that we haven't introduced yet. We will certainly introduce them and that will uh, make the Riemann tensor have more properties and more symmetries and more nice things, right? But so far, you've understood that you don't really need to have a metric. You don't need a metric at all to talk about curvature. All that you need is a differentiable manifold and an affine connection. And then you can talk about curvature. We're going to say that if the, if the Riemann tensor is zero, we call the covariant, the affine connection, a flat connection. <laughs> because it's got no curvature. All right. Now, I keep saying curvature, 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 and Riemann, 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 as in like they were the same thing. But to be honest, so far, I haven't given you any evidence that the Riemann tensor would be any associated with curvature, right? I have any association with curvature. It's about time we do it, and we're going to do it through the notion of geodesic deviation. Let's now relate the Riemann tensor with the notion of curvature using one of the ways in which we talked about uh, uh, we can relate curvature, we can find curvature if a manifold is curved, right? Basically, we're going to go with the fact that, uh, that parallel, parallel lines, <laughs> parallel curves, uh, don't get closer or further away from each other if there's no curvature. And curvature is precisely what does... Think of, of uh, again, let me take inspiration from general relativity that we will see later. General relativity basically says that the effect of gravitational forces is just a result of curvature in space-time. So you move it along geodesics, like the equivalent of the generalization of inertial, if you remember, no forces acting on me. And then if there's uh, some other geodesic and there's no gravity, well, I don't feel any attraction to anybody. But the attraction that I feel to uh, other geodesics, other people that are free falling with no forces, is due to the fact that there might be curvature in it. And that's why I get closer or further away from them. Now, if there are, if the geodesics, if, for example, the geodesics, what are the geodesics in R2? Well, we know, I mean, x, y, we know they're straight lines, right? They satisfy, remember, the geodesic equation with a flat connection, so they, all the coefficients of the connection are zero. We know that uh, the, the geodesic equation is just that the acceleration of the curve is zero, which means that, of course, the, the trajectory parameterized in terms of the parameter t, right? Uh, let's say this is the affine parameter t, would be just straight lines, <laughs> all right? With this x0 and this v are constant vectors. Now, of course, we know that if we are in a curve manifold, for example, think of a sphere, two parallel curves, for example, two meridians, will touch at what we call the poles, right? So they get closer or further away from each other. 
that notion, that notion of, is the notion of geodesic deviation. We're going to be able to define some, some notion of, in a way, acceleration as, in a way, the rate at which the geodesics get further away or closer to each other. And they can only get closer to each other and further away if there's curvature. And we're going to show that it's precisely when the Riemann tensor is non-zero that that can happen. All right, let's get to it. Imagine that I consider a family of geodesics that I'm going to call uh, gamma s, right, uh, with a fine parameter t. And that means that for different values of s, I have a different geodesic. You can think of this as threads making a beshi or something like that. So I have a bundle of geodesics. I think that the, imagine this is the manifold and I have a bundle of geodesics. But this bundle of geodesics are defined through a continuous family of uh, one parametric family of geodesics. So I, I have one geodesic here, then the next one next to it, then the next one next to it. And S would be the label that labels the thread, right? It's like a best sheet I have here, but it's made of individual threads, right? Every thread is the geodesic. So I have, um, if I, you know, if this is the best sheet, if you want, then you know that when you move in increasing S, you're going to be moving from one geodesic to another, right? Like that. Uh, and then when you increase t, you're going to be moving on the geodesic that you are, you move down, right? That is kind of nice. Well, I can choose this to be smooth, as again, the idea of the threads, right? Well, if I do it smoothly, I can, if I find a way to do it smoothly, it would mean that ts, which is a point in R2, right, can be mapped to a point in this bundle of geodesics, if you want. So to gamma s t, which is, by the way, a subset of the manifold M. So this bundle of geodesics, all the points in this bundle of geodesics is a sub-manifold of M. Then I can choose, I can use T and S as coordinates for this sub-manifold of dimension two. And in particular, I can define a vector T, let's call it with Sharifa, and of course it's a vector field. Now, we also know that these are geodesics. So their parameterized T is the affine parameter for the geodesics. So we know also that T has to satisfy the geodesic equation. So we know that T A, A T, B is equal to zero because they're geodesics. Well, therefore, let me introduce an independent vector. And I'm going to introduce an independent vector that I'm going to call Z. So that vector, if you want, is the vector that uh, generates the flow of changing from one thread to another. It's the vector in the direction of move to the next geodesic. You can interpret this vector in a way as joining uh, two threads, right? Joining two of the geodesics in an amount that is differentially closed, like ds, something like that. So this vector, z, that is partial s. So z uh, equals partial s, right, moves you in a way... Uh, it moves you from one geodesic to the next, right? And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that it generates the flow that gets you from, if I increase s, I move from one geodesic to another, and this is the vector in the direction of increasing s. <laughs> All right? Wonderful. Since t, this vector t is partial t, and t and s form a coordinate basis of the submanifold, then I know that uh, z and t commute. So because they form a coordinate basis, they commute, and that means that uh, the, the directional covariant derivatives like this are actually equal. Which I don't mind, maybe that's an exercise to prove because it's extremely easy with what we already know. Now, the next thing that we have is I'm going to define a vector, I'm going to call it V. So this vector V, I'm going to define it as the following. It's going to be the directional derivative in the direction of uh, the geodesics of the vector z. Or in coordinates, that means that Va is going to be equal to Tb covariant derivative B z a. Let's interpret this vector v. This vector v is the variation as I move down the geodesic, so in the direction of the geodesic, right? The variation as I move along the geodesics of the vector z. But remember that the vector z was the vector that at constant t told me the separation between two geodesics that are very close, right? So this vector v is at the velocity of approaching 
or a velocity of separation of the two geodesics as I move with the same value of the affine parameter. Okay, this is a velocity of separation of the two geodesics. Nice. I can even compute the second the directional derivative in the direction of the curve, so I can define a vector a such that this is, well, again, same as before, the directional derivative in the direction of the geodesics of the vector v. So this is like the second derivative of the vector z in the direction of the geodesics. So this is an acceleration. <laughs> this is kind of an apparent force, right? As in like the geodesics are being pulled together or separated. Okay, what is the value of this acceleration? Okay, let's compute it. All right, so first step, I just substituted v by what v is and brought it here. This is the acceleration vector if you want. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use the fact that I can interchange t and z inside this derivative. So I can write tc nabla c. And now I can write here zb nabla b ta, right? Using this, which is true because uh, t and z commute. Now, I apply Leibniz rule. So if I do Leibniz rule, I get the following. This is tc, uh, nabla c, uh, zb, nabla b ta, plus tc, zb, nabla c, nabla b ta. Now, in this first term, we can use again the fact that t and z commute to write the following. Z, c, nabla c, tb, right? And then nabla b, uh, ta. And for this one, I can actually use the expression of the anti-symmetrized covariant derivative of a vector field in terms of the Riemann tensor and write it in terms of the following two terms. Like this, to obtain these two terms, I use that, the thing that we derived right before, which is that the action, the contraction of the Riemann tensor with a vector field like this, with a minus sign, is equal to the, you put this here, to the anti-symmetrized double covariant derivative. Now, what I did is I moved the negative part of this anti-symmetrized double covariant derivative to the right, and that allows me to substitute this expression here by these two terms. Now, let's focus on these two terms here. Um, this thing is smelling like something. This thing smells like like this rule. <laughs> How do you see that? Well, um, look at that. You have the derivative of the first one, the second without derivation, and then product the first one times the second without derivation, the derivation of the second. Okay, so it definitely smells like like this rule. Let me manipulate it. I'm gonna change the dummy indices CB to, I'm gonna just swap them just to make it more manageable, like that. And that allows me to clearly see I have a set B and a set B here. So that, that's why I did that change. And now this is clearly set B and then nabla B of two, a product of two things that would give me this as like new rule. So this would be TC and uh, nabla C TA, right? So if you do, if you do, uh, if you do this, uh, well, of course, minus the Riemann tensor, let me just copy it, CBD. A, C, B, T, C, T, D. All right. Now, uh, you can tell that this is true, right? If you add with the Leibniz rule, you get derivative of this one times this one, which is this first term. And the second term is this one, which is here, times the derivative of the second, which is there. All right. But isn't this nice, though? <laughs> because this simplifies a lot. Let me write again and remind you, A, A. This is the acceleration vector. Now, why does it simplify? because this gammas are geodesics. So T is the affine parameter of these geodesic curves. So because uh, this T is the affine parameter, these guys are geodesics, this satisfies the geodesic equation <laughs> that I have right here. So this thing is exactly zero. So we find that the acceleration vector is equal to the minus Riemann contracted with the Z and the T vectors. Now, what does that mean? That means that for two geodesics, uh, that start at the same time, like fall in the same direction like this, for them to be uh, approaching or receding, you need the Riemann tensor to be non-zero. If the Riemann tensor is zero, the curves do not separate and do not get closer. The curves remain parallel. You have to start parallel, they end parallel. But if there's a non-zero Riemann tensor, you get geodesic deviation. So this is the reason why I'm telling you, or what the reason that I'm giving you right now, why the Riemann tensor is the one responsible for curvature. Without the Riemann tensor, let's nicify it a bit, uh, grooming it a bit, D, D, like that. 
without the Riemann tensor, there's no curvature. In fact, as I said, if the Riemann tensor is zero in the whole manifold, then we call the connection, the affine connection we define to the covariant derivative with, we call it a flat connection. Now, you see, <laughs> this is kind of cool, the acceleration between two geodesics, the acceleration, when we see relativity, you could think of it as something like, oh, in a way, the gravitational force that I'm feeling is certainly related to the Riemann tensor. Without a Riemann tensor, then you have no geodesic deviation. By the way, this is the geodesic deviation equation. That's the name it's known for. Just for making sure that nobody gets this wrong, this term is not there because it's zero because it's a geodesic. So this is the formula, the one in the box. That's the geodesic deviation equation. There are other ways to also see that the Riemann tensor is the one responsible for curvature. I have one in the notes in which I show that for, well, I show and I leave as an exercise to actually show it in detail, that uh, the variation of the direction of a vector in a closed loop that is small enough is also fully conditioned by the Riemann tensor, which remember is the exercise with the nose that you go back to the same point and now the noise can point in a different direction if it's a sphere that we talked about at the beginning of this video. Well, the Riemann tensor can be also shown to be responsible for that. Of course, the Riemann tensor is what's behind curvature. One last point that I want to make is that we've shown that we have a notion of curvature that does not require me to talk about anything like a metric. I haven't introduced a metric. We don't have a metric yet. We don't have that structure. That is actually the next thing we're going to introduce, the notion of a metric, the notion of a Riemannian manifold. But so far, we don't have a metric. And we can talk about curvature. You see, there are different ways in which we can give a manifold curvature, right? By just defining different affine connections. You see, we can define different affine connections and they will have a different amount of curvature, right? Different affine connections, different covariant derivatives. Now, if you have a metric on top of all this structure, so this extra bit, extra step of giving a metric to the manifold, then there's a particular way of choosing the covariant derivative, the affine connection, that will make special a particular kind of curvature. But you see, before introducing a metric, the notion of curvature already exists in the differential manifold the moment we introduce an affine connection. And I want to do that step by step so you see how we add extra structure, extra structure, until we get to a differential manifold that is equipped enough, equipped enough to be able to sustain the physics of space-time. Okay, that's all for today. Uh, I hope that we enjoyed together, I definitely did, uh, talking about the notion of uh, parallel transport, the notion of geodesics, the notion of curvature. Now, in the next video, we're going to address the notion of Riemannian manifolds. So when we have actually a metric and uh, if we can select a particular connection that makes the metric happy, <laughs> all that we will discuss in the next video. Until then, take care.